you know, if you make it um, a much less welcoming environment, and I don't mean by that that, you know, people start beating them with sticks when they arrive, but they just don't want to come because they know that at the end of the day, if they do come, they'll be sent straight back or something. What they won't be able to do is remain in this country and live here as, as if they were citizens. Indeed, Mike. Uh, I've always said there's three elements to this. One is dealing with the push factors. Why do people leave the place that they're leaving anyway, right. or the region? Then there's we've got to disrupt the the flow. Dis the people smugglers who are encouraging and facilitating this this movement need to be dealt with. And then back here in the UK, we've got mm. to deal with pull factors. Why do they want to come to the UK? What makes it an attractive destination? And we know that part of the attraction of, this, uh, of the UK as a destination is that they, they can sort of just, they're going to stay here. We're going to just accept them because we've got little choice as to what to do with them. Um, that's what we've got to address. Plus, of course, they get all the, all the benefits, they get the accommodation. And because, now this is a contentious point, but because we don't have a national ID card, we're one of very few countries in the world that doesn't, it means that actually it's very difficult to track people. It's very difficult to pin down employers who are employing these people. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's, there's all sorts of problems around that. And from that point of view, I would support a national ID card, not a big digital yeah. thing such as Tony Blair would argue for. Absolutely not. That's that's Big Brother. Um, but this this you know, the, the, most countries in the world have a, a much simpler thing than he's he's proposed in the past, yes. and I think it would help us with with dealing with with the UK as a destination. Yeah, of course. I mean, meanwhile, we're learning today from Rwanda that they're not in any way going to return any part of the 270 million quid uh, that they've already received from us, um, which is a bit disappointing, to say the least. Um, but also, the idea that somehow um, the people who have come here and who will continue to come here will continue to receive benefits and will continue to receive housing, even as we know yep. uh, the Labour Party is saying, oh, we must build more houses. They don't seem to take into account the fact that one of the reasons that there's a housing shortage is because there's an awful lot more people living here now. Yeah, and, indeed, Mike. And, you know, on Rwanda first, look, why should they give that money back? Um, they were given sort of guarantees. They were, you know, the UK said, well, look, we're giving you this money to... Actually, a lot of that money has been spent in the infrastructure, providing the infra infrastructure in Rwanda anyway. Mm. It can't be recouped. But, um, you know, the, uh, why should the Rwandans give it back, to be quite honest? Um, the, well, I mean, they should here, give it back because they haven't done anything with it, really. I mean, you're not going to well, tell we, me that... We, you're not going to tell me that each migrant that was sent there uh, cost the equivalent of about, sort of, you know, the nearly 14,000... You know, 140... Forty million quid each. Yeah, but I mean, Mike, if you buy a car, you know, from somebody and it, you you pay twenty grand for it, and actually then later you find that it was only worth twelve grand, you've paid the money, you've agreed to pay the money, you know. Uh, um, it, yeah, but if you don't get the car, you might go and go and knock on the door and go, "Can I have the, can I have my money back?" <laughs> yeah, you might do, but if that car... I mean, in this case, we're talking about bricks and mortar. Look, I, I think the fault here doesn't lie with Rwanda. I think the fault li lies with the Conservative government that went down this route. Um, I, th yes. I think it was ill plan badly planned, badly conceived, badly thought through and badly executed. Um, so, you know, uh, the fault lies with the Conservative government, not the Rwandans on, on this basis, I think. But then what happens back here? Now, I'm still trying to search for what the answer is, Labour Party's answer is, for the accommodation, because they're saying that they're not going to use the hotels. Right. So, and they have implied that they are going to set up purpose-built uh, facilities where these people are going to be be detained and accommodated. Now, I hope that's the case because that's what I've been arguing for. Because if you, if you, if the if these people coming across the the channel are put up in hotels, well, you know they're straight out into the economy. They're 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 not. That's not a deterrent, and, and you can't you lose track of them. You can't even provide for their welfare mm. properly. So, uh, you know, I've I've argued all along that these people actually should be. Uh, pulled into a sort of a number of centralised facilities where purpose-built accommodation is built. I mean, prefabricated stuff on a temporary basis. It's out of out of the local communities. You can you can concentrate all your logistics mm. in one place, all your security in one place, all your policing in one place. Now that's if you've got them here. I mean, of course, we've got to stop the flow. But once they're here, we've got to do something with them. That's a practical reality. And I'm still trying to figure out, maybe Labour, Labour is trying to figure it out exactly what they're going to do. Um, but they've not got much time to do this because I, I suspect that, you know, people will very rapidly start b bringing them to account on this oh, matter. I'm sure. And, 
And there'll be and more and more people, it. and more and more people arriving, literally by the boatload every single day. Um, James Indeed. Cleverly said this as well today, Henry. Just before I let you go, um, mm. I hope that the new Labour government has had the courtesy of formally informing the government of Rwanda that they are tearing up the bilateral treaty with another Commonwealth nation. I hope that the Prime Minister, or at least the Foreign Secretary, has called his opposite number rather than just leaving them to read about the decision in the media. Yeah, I, well, I hope they have as well. It would be sort of a diplomat, diplomatic faux pas not to, and yeah. we would lose the goodwill of Rwanda if we if we did want to do something with them in the future of any sort. Why would they, you know, they, they, it's, but then again, you know, we, we, there's a lot of bad feeling at the moment among some people after the election, and I think yeah. this, this, you know, this is James Cleverly. Look, James Cleverly and the, and, and the government that he was part of set this up as, as we've said, in, a, in an ill-conceived, ill-thought-through and ill-executed manner. Mm. And, you know, the blame, I'm sorry, James, lies largely with you. I've said all along that the Foreign Office should have been engaging more strongly and more sort of in a more focused manner to mm. support the Home Office in, in getting agreements on returns and so on. Um, you know, it, it, sorry, James, this is largely at your doorstep. Um, now, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not being political about this, but where the blame should lie, you know, it should correctly be pointed, mm. you know, correct blame should be apportioned to the correct people. And in this case, James, better that you keep quiet about yeah. it, I think. I think, um, I think you're probably right. Henry Bolton, thank you very much indeed.